So everyone, uh, very pleased uh, to, uh, to welcome uh, Mary Elizabeth Sutherland uh, here. Um, it's a, a wonderful uh, sequence to uh, Magdalena Skipper, who visited uh, a few weeks ago, uh, who gave the overarching picture of, of, um, of nature and the nature organization. Um, what, um, what's wonderful uh, with, uh, with Mary Elizabeth is A, she, she actually handles manuscripts, and, uh, so that's a pretty, a pretty wonderful thing to be talking to someone who actually is, is doing, doing the editing. But in particular, um, she, she actually brings humanity uh, back into nature. We are now part of nature. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, and I say this as someone, as I was, as I was you know, a lot of this movie whining a little bit to Mary Elizabeth earlier uh, about having papers just rejected by nature because they didn't do social science, because humans apparently are not part of nature, uh, is, that, uh, is that nature has now decided. Yeah. We're welcome. Yeah. And, and they had a, um, a, a search in, um, in, uh, for their first social science Senior editor, and like this is this is actually a full time job, not like uh, a lot of uh, academia. And uh, and Mary Elizabeth, who had done wonderful work in uh, nature human behavior before, uh, was uh, came to the fore uh, because of her uh, because of her wonderful work in, in the space. And uh, and so this is really in some ways I think it's a it's a really important uh, moment uh, because um, because it it. Um, it uh, you know, to, to be on the agenda and to be part of what is being served up in a journal like Nature or a journal like Science, which also has their first uh, social science editor yeah. uh, who, who actually is across the river and, and, and sometimes will have, will have Tej Rai over sometimes as well. And the last he's in, he's in DC yeah, this week. So, um, but, um, but like, it, it, it's important for shaping the the, the general overarching social sciences as well as the, the position of social sciences vis-a-vis -vis the sciences uh, more generally. And so uh, I think this is uh, a special moment. Mary Elizabeth is, is, is the right person at the right time. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm really pleased that you're willing to step up here to join us. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, David. It's a real pleasure for me to be here um, and to be in this role, right? To be able to shape uh, nature and the behavioral sciences. And when I say behavioral sciences, I mean stuff that has to do with humans generally. Like it really, it's really quite broad. Um, and so my talk today is sort of organized into explaining what it is that I'd like to do in the behavioral sciences going into how editors think about, you know, how we make our decisions, how do we think the different journals, um, the questions we ask when evaluating a manuscript, um, and just some best practices that might be helpful. Um, but it is really like me thinking what would be useful for you. And if I've gotten it wrong, and there's questions that you have that are more useful to you than whatever I put on a slide, please interrupt and ask. This is an informal presentation, and it's really a chance to get to know each other and what, what it is that both sides are doing because we have to publish and you have to publish. So the best is when we can work together on this. So in right nature research, generally there's a lot of journals of nature. Um, there's nature at the top. And the idea, like, I think of it as a bit of a pyramid. Um, with the idea that nature up at the top is looking to publish those broad things in the social sciences now, yes, finally, um, questions that have broad impact. So it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be interdisciplinary, but if it's within the field, that it would have broad impact. So it would impact a really key theory, right, within within a field, uh, that it would have societal or policy relevance. So it can be within a field, but then the question is a big, meaty one. It's not a very small, specific one within the field. So that's kind of nature. Then there's the Nature Research Journal. So that's like nature and then something. And so the most relevant is where I was before, Nature Human Behavior. Um, and that, the idea is that you know, it's of importance, but to human behavior. So the punchline 
that takeaway that you want to get across is really of interest to people um, who are working on understanding human behavior. Um, and then in that realm, also for the social sciences, I would say uh, nature energy, nature climate change, and nature sustainability are all doing a lot of social publishing social science things specifically when the behavior you're doing is related to, let's say, climate change, right? So how can we get more people to, if the word believe doesn't seem right, but anyway, how can we get more people to accept that the fact that it was 90 yesterday in October in New York is a signal that things aren't quite normal, right? So if, if your question is, let's say, specific to climate change or to energy usage, energy adoption, right? It could also, your paper could be a good fit for one of those journals. And then nature human behavior for the more overarching. And then down here you have nature communications, which is a high quality paper, um, but it can be a more narrow advance. It can also be interdisciplinary because nature communications covers everything, but it's it can also be more narrow because what they consider is really that it's a good, significant advance in that field, and they're publishing a lot, so it doesn't matter if it's appealing to a broad range of people in, let's say, human behavior. So um, as you can see, I would say the axis is sort of, you know, the breadth of appeal is, is going up as you go up this pyramid. And something else that I don't have listed on here is the depth of your story. So how much detail you go into in the paper. So if you have you know, an observation that's important, but we don't really know, is it unique to you know, algorithm X, or could it be explained by something else that's more nature communications, then you get up a little bit more in the story, you get to the nature research journals, and then you have to have a, quite a developed story to get to nature. So it's the breadth of appeal and the depth. Um, and this is really how we are. This is, this is our publishing um, in the behavioral sciences. And it's great that finally now we have, um, we're doing more of this for nature. So like I said, um, when I say behavioral science, I, this is just like an idea. I'm sure there are more things that I haven't really thought of, but it's really, it's really all of this. So the reason that I bring this up is each nature journal is run, like we're, we're all professional editors. So that means we all got a PhD, most people did at least a postdoc, um, and then we left the field of academia to become editors. <coughs> Um, but like my background is in cognitive neuroscience. So I have a background that has psychology and neuroscience. Um, I also had, a, had some experience in musicology, so that's my humanities side. Um, but it means I've learned these other fields through being an editor at Nature Communications and Nature Human Behavior and through my engagement with nature. But I'm learning every paper I read. And I'm also learning every visit like this I do. And just to give you an idea that the editors handling your paper are trying to do the best they can, but it's a very broad, uh, we're handling a lot. And so the most you can do to educate your editor in your cover letter, in you know, reaching out to them, in these sorts of interactions, the better because you know, it's hard for me, for example, like sociology is huge. So I need to know what are the key topics in sociology? Like where are the debates? Where are people, what are people thinking? So I can go to conferences, I read a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> um, you know, and I can search and I can see like citation patterns, right? By looking at what papers are doing what, where, where the interest is, looking at all metric scores. I, I have all these tools. But just to say, um, please do always reach out and educate your editors because we're trying to cover a large breadth and there are things that we can get wrong. So I would say this is approximately my remit. Approximately. Yeah. Are you okay taking questions now? Yeah, of course. Okay. Please. Great. Uh, so I'm wondering when you say educate your editor, um, 
How exactly? Do you mean more than just in the cover letter? The cover letter is great. Um, so I guess it's the way that you do that in the cover letter. So often people will say, like, this is an important topic, which is not very informative. So giving an example of why it's an important topic is really useful. So the cover letter, um, yeah, the cover letter is your best option because it's really your pitch at why something is important. Um, and then just also in the framing of your paper so that you make it clear what the gap in knowledge is that you're addressing and how you address that. So I read many papers where the authors are aware of the gap, but they never explicitly tell you what's missing. They summarize the background literature, and then they say what they've done. And it's up for you to infer the gap. It makes it harder to understand the importance of that gap than when it's delineated, right? Like, from here to here, this is our gap, and we need to build that bridge. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. And so, just to clarify, you don't mean actually reaching out and contacting an editor apart from um, that is also something you are welcome to do. Uh, something in this field that I'll get to, I think maybe in my next slide, <laughs> um, is understanding more about the areas within the fields that are really relevant for a broad number of people. So that is something that I would like to do, especially in the behavioral sciences for nature, because it's something that we don't have established yet. So I'd really like to uh, spend time on outreach and on individual conversations to get an idea of the field. Um, what tends to happen at journals, as I'm sure you've all experienced, right, David's experience with uh, nature not accepting social science. And then the problem is that nature says, we don't accept it, then they don't get it, right? So that means that the papers I see are not actually representative of what's going on in the field because the people who read nature are like, well, they don't publish in this, so why would we send it? So they're going elsewhere. But now I need to figure out what's going not to me that I want to get. Like that's really my mission now at, in developing this in nature is saying, what are the things that we should be getting that we haven't been getting because people look at our table of contents and they say they don't publish that. Um, and the only way I know how to do that is, <laughs> is by actually like doing this type of outreach or having relationships, building relationships with people where they do come and tell me and say, hey, like, this is really important. There's whole conferences that go on in this. You know, this is a topic you need to consider because um, I need to learn that somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Just a follow-on question, which is how how this all gets um, an active organization. So let me be specific because this is, I know a bit about how science does this, yeah. which is there's a deputy editor, a manuscript goes to them. Yeah. They might just reject it. I can do the flow chart. So right. you know, half manuscripts, they probably just say, oh, no. Right. And then, then the other half, they send to a reviewing editor. Right. Um, do you have reviewing editors? I mean, so like they have like 200 reviewing editors. I was a reviewing editor. I would, if, if it was in my domain and, and I was sent it, then I would give some comments. I'd sort of say, it looks great, not so much, what have you. Uh, and here's some potential reviewers. And so the question I have here is, like, do you have other reservoirs of expertise that you consult in, in the process? Right. So the way that things work for us is that the new paper comes in and it goes entirely, so any journal with nature in the name, it goes entirely to in-house editors. Um, so that means it would go, right, if it's in the behavioral sciences, it would go to me. Um, we then consult, so my colleagues on the physics team, uh, I consult with for the computational social stuff mostly uh, when it has a heavy physics component, right, because that's something that I can't. So what we try to do is we try to do in-house expertise in consulting between the relevant backgrounds of the editors we have to make that first decision to send out to peer review or to reject without review. Um, in the case of you know newer disciplines, uh, we do also go out for informal advice, but that is rare. We usually make that initial decision uh, based on us and based on you know who's been handling what in the team and what's been 
what's gone out. <coughs> but that's usually made in-house. And then when we go out for review, that's when we start to get the community feedback. And then sometimes we go, let's say you have your three reviewers, but you're still, you're not sure about some of the comments that are made. We either have people, like reviewers comment on reviewers comments, mm -hmm. or we'll go for external advice. So if we have, let's say, two that are very, two that have the same expertise, but are coming at something like this, we'll try to find somebody else with that expertise to comment on these two who is unrelated. So we usually go for the external advice only after that first decision. Right. So it's very profoundly different, generally, interestingly, than science. Uh, yeah. You know, you're the only, the only other journal one would say it's similar to Nature. Right, right. And so I think the idea for, um, the reason that Nature has this model is they're stressing the idea of a professional editor, I guess, um, is that you have no skin in the game. So I have no conflict of interest to try to get things in my discipline published more or less, which of course can then influence the funding, right? Or the perceived importance in that cover letter when you're like, hey, well, you know, science publishes, nature published this. Like, I, I don't have anything anymore. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> so you have this, um, this sort of version of it where you're getting somebody who doesn't have any potential conflict on that front. Um, and also who is specializing in taking the time in assessing the breadth of potential impact. Because uh, if you think of now, like my research is developing strategies, which is looking at where papers are published, how they're being cited, how they're being picked up in the media, you know, like who's, who's collaborating with whom. It's really like, that's, those are the analyses I do these days. <laughs> it's sort of, um, for our own strategies. So it's taking that expertise as opposed to the domain specific expertise and waiting for that to the peer review process where you then say, okay, do these methods really address the question? Yeah. So I'll get more into this um, after I just go through a few things. I put this on this, yeah. Um, of then what we're trying to do for the behavioral sciences. So some of the things that I'm trying to do in a, in a broad sense, right? So something that we're trying to do is uh, publishing more, and I say that by broadening our format types. So we have now matters arising, which are basically, if there's an issue with a paper, you now have the chance to write more of a substantial, not just a 500 word correspondence, but like an actual paper type data thing that can be um, refute the claims, can show where they're flawed. Uh, and this is nice because it's online, so we're flexible with the format and the word length so that it can justify, you know, it can actually adequately critique a paper. Um, which is very necessary. So these, we have some of these, um, the correspondences everybody knows, those are shorter forms, comments. So something that I've been doing is working with, there are different editors at Nature for the comments and for the news and views, but that I work with them. So if I get a paper that is of broad interest, but that there's not that much data in it, so I don't think it has the breadth of that, it can't make the type of story, I can say to the comments editor, hey, this might be something you should be interested in, and then I basically do the cover letter, explain why it's of importance, and then see if they'll work with this to have it as like, you know, there's data and it's good data, but it's a shorter format, less in-depth, just, you know, a single observation. Um, news and views, so these are on papers that we publish, but also um, if people have interesting work that's coming out in other journals, you can ping me before it comes out and see if it's something that the news and views team can cover because then it's going to get into a little thing in nature like hey there's this cool finding coming out um, which I want to use to signal our interest in the behavior well, in human social sciences generally um, the same is true for research highlights so news and views are slightly longer research highlights are just short little it's kind of like an abstract, but written in a more public-friendly form as opposed to an academic form. 
Um, then we also have perspectives and reviews. So these are generally commissioned. So if you have an idea for a perspective and a review um, in nature, your best bet is to talk to the editor to see if it's an idea they would be able to pursue or not because we have a very limited number that we're allowed to publish per year because we have to balance it across all of the fields represented by all of the editors. So that's like from earth science, physical science, ecology, evolution, everything. Um, Nature Human Behavior can publish many more reviews. So I think I used to publish one or two like review perspectives a month. So an issue. Um, so there, if you have an idea, um, they're much more receptive because they have the capacity to publish more um, as long as it's of relevance to human behavior. The same is true for nature communication. So if you have ideas, I would say probably nature human behavior and nature communications are more likely to be fruitful, but you can always approach the editor. But for these, it's usually better to get an idea either as a pre-submission inquiry you know, in terms of is this something you would consider more? Um, because the success rate is a bit less and is a lot, a lot of it is due to the editorial vision of that journal. Um, then something I'd like to work on, but it's going to have to wait a little, um, is an insight. Um, an insight is basically a collection of articles on a topic. So. In, uh, in nature human behavior, we call them a focus. In nature, we call it an insight. Don't ask me why. We call it a collection in nature communications. Really no idea why we have different names for these things. But basically what it is is that you're putting together a series of articles. My background is musical, so I think of it as an album as opposed to just a single, you know, just songs by themselves that really get at um, either providing an overarching view of where the field is or get at a specific issue from different perspectives. Um, so this is something that I'd like to work on um, in collaboration with my physics colleagues, hopefully on computational social science, but it's, it's going to take me a bit because they take a long time. <laughs> but it's also a vehicle, you know, and something that you can speak to editors about doing these types of focuses. Um, and then finally, the registered reports, which we only have at Nature Human Behavior at this point. I'm hoping to get to Nature, but again, that's going to take a bit more time. Um, but Nature Human Behavior does consider registered reports. So if anyone has questions about that, um, I'm happy to answer yeah, in, more, in more detail. Um, and then something, yeah, the final one are these policy briefs, which I mentioned. Nature Energy should start publishing them. But we're, um, the idea is that we want to expand our readership from just the academics to people who are involved in policy. So we've come up with this sort of template, um, and these will all be open access, and we're developing like a mailing list of basically policy people to send this to. And this is where your paper, with our help, gets rewritten into a page, which is very unacademic. It's like, what you found comes first what policy question addresses, there's no methods, no one cares about the methods. We, we developed this in um, collaboration with policy makers, and they're like, why do you keep telling us how you do this? Like, we, we don't care. What, what problem are you fixing? Great, done, done. Like, black box it all the way. I don't link to the paper, but it's, it's kind of funny because it's very different than how academics think, and we kept trying to stick in methods, and they kept being like, guys, we don't care. <laughs> really, we, we don't have much time. Like, just tell us the point. Um, so that's coming out in Nature Energy and will hopefully spread through. And again, this will be policy relevant papers to try to broaden the readership. Um, this isn't probably not going to help in terms of citations, but in terms of the overall impact. Um, so then the other thing that we're, so that's really, I guess, this first one, I would say, is sort of like information diffusion. How are we communicating? How are we helping talk more about this? And then our next main thing is the ensuring replicability and transparency. So there's a lot to be done here. Um, some of the things that, we, that we're actually doing is um, recognizing peer reviewers now to show that like, they're part of the process. So in nature, if you're a reviewer, you have the choice to put your name 
publicly with the paper so that we're already part of publons so that you can say, you know, oh, I've reviewed for them. But here it means like you can point to a paper and say, see, my, my name is on as a reviewer. Like I did a lot. Um, Nature Human Behavior is actually saying who the editors are for the paper. So you can start to know who to go to and who has been doing that work. Um, we support preprints. At Nature Communications, we actually have a linked page. So if you have a preprint, you can have it on the Nature Communications homepage as under, like under peer review. So you can see which papers, again, if you choose, right, are, are under peer review so that we are trying to um, make, yeah, not hold up people putting their results out. So not only does it not count as, you know, any kind of scoopage, but trying to feature that. Um, we have transparent peer review at Nature Communications, which means if, again, the authors are the ones who have to choose this, we publish, as the supplementary information, we publish the peer reviewer reports. Again, they can be anonymous, right? Reviewer one, reviewer two. It's if, as a reviewer, it's up to you if you want to sign your name. Um, but it means that you can actually see what the reviewer said, also the point-by-point -point response, so you can see how the paper has um, changed. And when I've given more master classes on writing for younger people, it's been really helpful for them to understand the peer review process, what a good point by point is. It's a good teaching tool, um, but it's also nice to see what the peer review process does. So then the other thing, we have this editorial policy and reporting checklist um, that really make you give a lot of details so that you can't get away with methods that don't have key details um, omitted. Um, this comes along with statistical requirements, the guidelines you know, for how to plot your figures, plotting individual data points when necessary, or the proper distributions. Um, and now we're starting with extended data, which is basically linking 10 figures or tables from your supplementary into the online version of the text. So it's essentially, for online, it's like an extension of 10 figures slash tables uh, so that you don't need to download a separate PDF or open it in another thing and then search for figure, supplementary figure three. Um, right, then this is, the, this all goes into working into holding, really understanding what's good practice in the community and holding that um, as an editorial bar for methods. Um, right, matters arising I already talked about. <laughs> and considering replication studies and null results. So we're actually, yeah, we're actually publishing replication studies and null results when, when the null results are strong and informative. So to make a strong null results paper, you have to have a hypothesis where the answer yes or no is of interest and significance. And you have to have the ability to answer that no strongly. So that means that your, you have to, your sample has to be of an adequate size to detect the smallest meaningful effect. You have to have statistical testing for the null, right, in order, in Bayes factors or in equivalent testing. Like you, you have to actually have support for it, not just, I didn't find anything, that wouldn't be. But we are considering this, again, based on the research question. So I guess, oh yeah. That's just an example. So like experimental design, sample size, describe how sample size is determined. Data exclusion, describe any data exclusion. So when we send something to review, we make you fill this in because it's amazing how many papers don't have this in the paper. And so it's just to make sure that this information is there. So it's really easy to see, even if it's redundant with the paper, that you can easily find these sorts of um, information. Um, and these, if you're ever thinking of writing a paper, these are easily findable on our website. And I suggest looking at them when you write your paper and making sure that you have this information in the methods just as good practice. Right. The same is true for the uh, editorial policy. So making sure that you have data availability, um, code availability, you know, that you've described informed consent, or if you don't have informed consent from human subject, that you have the appropriate IRB waiver, right? We want to make sure that we're supporting ethical research. Great, and then the most important, I would say, is this building relationships with the, uh, with the community. <laughs> um, 
I don't think I, the, the, that we do this anymore, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, I would like to have a wonderful author-editor relationship, mm -hmm. perhaps not exactly in this form, but again in the form of understanding what it is that's important for the community, what it is that we can help to further those standards and uphold them, and ideally to have a transparent um, way of describing our editorial criteria so that you know what we want and you can easily assess whether or not it fits. And of course that comes from you know, trial and error sometimes in, in submitting and not, but the more that we can have a conversation about it, then the more we can match and not have all of the time wasted in submitting and doing this essentially. Great, so now on to uh, what I do every day. Um, so this is how you get published. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, I think I'm, I'm not sure. Funny. Exactly, you get to choose. You get to see who do I look like most today. <laughs> um, so the editorial process at Nature is quite different in that we're making, we're making a lot of decisions a lot of the time. So we read all of the papers that come in. Um, there are some that come in that are like clearly out of scope, those ones we don't read. Um, but that's like, people submitting photos, no joke. <laughs> it's like you get very weird submissions. <laughs> if you submit a real paper, like paper, I'll read it. I'll read it and I'll, I'll basically, we read it and we take notes, like a little summary. It's basically a mini review. Um, and then we decide whether or not to send it out to peer review and have about, a, depends on who you are, but a, a good paragraph describing strengths and weaknesses and why you're making the decision that you've made. Um, and I'll go through the points after this slide to describe what those are and how we think of them. Um, so then we send about 10 to 20 percent out to peer review and the rest are rejected without review. These numbers, I, I put it in, but it's, um, it's very variable between different subjects at this point, within, between different disciplines. Um, so I wouldn't, don't put too much weight on this because people are very different in terms of this. And then of course, if it goes to peer review, we choose, the way that we choose peer reviewers too, I think is, is important. It's basically the expertise that we think is necessary to adequately judge your paper. So often I know that I send requests and the title of the paper doesn't seem like it fits with the expertise, but usually it's because Usually I try to specify in the letter, it's because there is an aspect that I need help with. So let's say I have um, a paper that has to do with, you know, social economic status and, and cognition and like all of these different things and they use some machine learning approaches. I'll try to get a machine learning expert on that to make sure that those approaches are valid, even though they might not study anything that has to do with you know, social economic status or cognition because I want to make sure that those, those methods are valid. So we really pick reviewers according to the, like, according to this, what expertise is necessary to judge the paper well. Um, yeah, and so we appreciate your suggestions. They're always helpful. But usually what we do is we start and we think of the paper and we think, okay, what does this paper tap into? What are the main things? We list those, we list names that come up, you know, as good people in those fields. And when there's some overlap with suggested reviewers, it's great. But sometimes people also just suggest reviewers on one particular thing, like in network science, maybe you just suggest people who work on networks. But it's actually, you're looking into a problem in political science, and I also want that. Um, and I realize that this can be frustrating for authors because if, let's say, you have a political scientist and a network person, they could have very different ideas, but we have quite a heavy editorial hands and understand that people don't need to agree um, and tend to then overrule a lot of concerns, but we need to get the main, the main opinion, if that makes any sense. So basically, like, if the network science person says, this is totally fine, but like, who really cares because it's not moving our, our understanding of networks forward. 
What the political scientist says, this is answering a really important question in political science. I will say, thank you, network person, like the punchline was actually in <laughs> political science, so it's okay, the methods are sound, like this is well done, it's robust, we're not worried about the validity of the conclusions, that's okay that there's no novelty, right? So we will make those judgments there. Um, yeah, and then it goes through this sort of thing, but it means that there's a lot of editorial input at these stages in terms of what's necessary for a revision and, yeah, what are the comments that we're considering, and then finally, hopefully it gets to accept. Yeah, so that's sort of uh, what we're doing. We have papers at all stages at all times. So, yeah. Uh, three reviewers, or is this the... It depends on the paper. Uh, so when I have an interdisciplinary paper, again, it depends on how broad that paper is. So if it's a paper that, let's say, has like health behavior, but then uses certain behavioral like nudges, techniques, and has social influence, and then they do some weird maths, it'll have at least four. <laughs> Right, so it, it really depends. Um, and then sometimes there are controversial papers, let's say, who pit theory A against theory B. So then I will try to have the main authors of theory A and theory B, but they will each have a conflict of interest. So then I try to find people who will be in the middle, who can judge those comments, those comments, and the paper. It'll also likely be more than three. Um, on the other hand, if you have a really standard paper, sorry, really standard isn't there, but if you have a, a paper that's important and falls squarely in a discipline, and there's not really big controversies and people who have different opinions, then like three is great. Yeah, so it, it depends on the paper. Yeah. Just, uh, I'll know, or I'll, I'll get your reaction on this, and this is one of the things I've heard from a number of editors at Nature is um, the degree of autonomy that editors work with. Um, like, in a lot of journals, it sort of feels like majority vote right. uh, for the reviewers. Uh, but in fact, ultimately, it's for, for nature, it seems like, is the, is the editor persuaded by the arguments of the referees, which Correct. is a very different model than, and, and so I'm just saying that in part because you know, so the rest of the room hears yeah. that because that's a yeah. very different notion of it's. It, you know, of course, it's always a part about persuading the editor, but more yeah. so actually, uh, it seems for nature than, than for most journals. Exactly, and sometimes we go back to reviewers to ask them to explain their points because, for example, if somebody says this is a really crappy paper, we don't learn anything, and somebody says this is a great paper, super novel. To me, those weigh the same because I'm learning nothing from either. <laughs> like, why? Why is it new and exciting? Like, what is it informing? And the same thing. Why is it bad? Why don't we care? Um, so I usually do try to go back and say, could you, you know, explain what led you to this conclusion? Um, but yes, it, it is about the logic um, in here in those arguments. And then the other point is, uh, do we think it's something that's addressable? So in that peer review to revise decision, um, sometimes things are possible, but they're very improbable. So we give this sort of, you can revise, but like I'm actually going to consider this a reject and explain to you why. So we, I guess it's it's not very nice of us to put it in this way, but basically it's, it's a bit of a, I learned this in the editing world, it's a legal thing. If we give you a revised decision, your manuscript is under consideration with us and you can't submit it somewhere else without withdrawing from us. And so if we've given you a revised decision, which is like you did, let's say, amount one for the paper, and we need you to do that times five, that's a lot. So we don't think it's fair, it's, it's possible, but it's like, well, what if that grad student needs to move on? It's unlikely, so we reject it specifying usually, you know, without additional data that extends your work to this population, to this, this, to that, that, that. Um, what's the word that I usually find? Uh, we don't think it would be fruitful to invite a revision at this time. You know, we therefore wish you the best of luck. So basically I'm telling you, 
this is what you need to do, but I'm giving you the reject so that if you want to take that paper somewhere else, you can. And if you want to come back to me, you can as well, but it's like, it's free. The paper is free. Because if I actually submit a revised decision, technically the paper is under consideration with us and you can't do anything with that without withdrawing, which is a big pain. It's not a big pain, but you just have to do it. Yeah. I'm curious if you're studying, if you're doing sort of science of reviewing, mm. um, because there may be systematic relationships between the number of reviewers and your chance of acceptance. That's and interesting. This is something, uh, as someone who works at the intersection, typically of three fields. Right. Um, it's uh, there's, there's a number of hurdles. Yeah. To leap. And I've wondered if there are data on, um, you know, just because every reviewer, I always feel like I must come up with some weaknesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so are you doing a science of reviewing behind the scenes? I haven't been, but it's a very interesting question, and it's one I should look into because I get papers that often need more than three. Um, so I should look at it. We have an in-house, like, data team uh -huh. um, who do analyze, for example, like the things I talked about with transparent peer review, you know, who look at like who's opting in, who's clicking on this, who cares, um, these sorts of things. But I don't know one about number of reviewers, so I should start to track it myself. I can yeah. say from, from our perspective, what's interesting is I feel like the more reviewers I have, the more heavy-handed I am editorially. Because <laughs> I'm reviewing, <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, I tend to like overrule and highlight concerns left and right because each person is coming from a very specific um, place. Um, but I don't have data to speak to your question. But it's interesting. I should start keeping track of it. I mean, my qualitative impression is just that I do more work in identifying what are the important things and then in the decision letter for revise, say like, this, you know, this point from reviewer one is really important. This point from reviewer one we don't really care about. This point from reviewer two, yes. This point, no. And then I also, um, we write back to the reviewers and explain the decision. So I also write to them and say, like, this is the decision we made. Here's the information on why. So that they can also start to understand for these more interdisciplinary papers, like, how we're thinking about it, at least, yeah. hopefully, yeah. potentially. There might be really some systematicities there between yeah. the number and makes uh, sense. Yeah, I mean the small groups literature would right. suggest that it would be. Yeah, I'll I'll start keeping track. It's a good idea. So you could do some randomization in there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what, that's on my slide of things that we care about. <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah, so on to the actual publishing process, so one of the most things, the best things you can do is getting to know the journal, right? See like the types of things that are being published. Um, in this case, for Nature, it's not the best because we haven't been publishing so much in the places that I'd like to go, so maybe it should be Get to Know Me. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but generally, getting to know the journal is really good because you can sort of see how in-depth the paper needs to go, what types of papers are, are being published, and it's a useful way to gauge whether you'll more or less likely be successful. Um, but since we don't have that for nature, I can kind of go through the questions that we ask when we read a first submission. So one of the most important ones is, what does your paper actually show? Um, and I'd like to stress that we, we actually look at the data for this. So we, telling me that you show something that's really amazing but you don't actually show is not impressive. Like, we actually look at what's shown, you know? We try to look at the figures, we try to look at the analyses, you know, what, what are the things that you've done. So not what is told, but what is actually shown. Um, then we want to put that in context. What's known? What did we know before? So this is to understand, again, that gap that I said, right? Like, what, what do we know? What don't we know? Um, and also to evaluate the events. And so something that is 
unfortunately bad practice. Sometimes people just omit references that have shown what they're showing. Um, we find them. <laughs> like, I know PubMed, I know Google Scholar, great, you know, <laughs> the internet is a great thing. Um, so just because references aren't listed doesn't mean we don't see them, and especially like we saw behavioral sciences are really wide. Remember, I know I can't know all the literature, and I might miss papers, so it doesn't mean I find them all the time. But I do search, I do search, um, you know, and things come up. So just, you know, saying what is known and really summarizing what why your problem is important is really key um, instead of that. So we have what you've shown, what there is before. Now the question is the scope, right? Um, what type of scope is it? Is it a broad or narrow a specialist approach? And the thing is that there are, like all of these things need to be published. We want broad things published. We want specialist things published. It's just a question of where. And so the nature journals, you know, from the nature communications up are not generally narrow specialists. Nature communications is more narrow specialist than nature. Um, but in general, we're looking for a broader, a broader question of interest. So one way um, to think about this, I mean, I have this, you know, is the question central in the specific disciplines. I find for academics this tends to be hard to answer because you are in your discipline and everything you do, like your question is central to it. So it's kind of hard to uh, evaluate that one. But this, if you want to know sort of one of our approaches, we look at the discipline specific journals that are broad, like a range of discipline specific journals. And the question is, does this one come up? Does this question come up in all of them? That's a way to know, like, okay, it's not just being in published in, like, it seems like it's central because it's my world, um, but you can see it come up in different places. Um, and that's also a way to know if the research question is broad or narrow, is look at, look at who you're citing in your paper. So if you're citing all, like, network science papers, it's probably a narrow focus. If you're citing network science, psychology, political science, marketing, consumer, even if they're all smaller journals, then it's likely broad interest because you're drawing on these pieces of research that go into all these different places. Another way of looking at that is where are the key references published? You know, are they published in general journals or in specific journals? So if you have a bunch of different specific journals, then it's broad as well, but those are sort of some of the ways of looking at it, you know, from your side for how to evaluate. So these are the things that we're, you know, we're thinking of broad now. Yeah. Do you also recommend then presenting your paper to a room of different disciplines and see what actually they're interested about? Because I always, you know, mm. present work three times before I submit anything. Right. And so I've done this a few times that, you know, I'm like, well, this is such a key thing to finance, and I present it to a finance professor that I completely uninterested. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's a really great point. Yeah, 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 exactly. So anything that you can do to give yourself an idea of this, um, because that's we're really looking at that broad, broad to narrow, and that's where you get the different things. So any, yeah, any tips for understanding that is good. Um, and then the question is, you know, what you're showing is it a conceptual advance? Is it a methodological advance, a policy-related or societal advance, or what I'm going to say, an evidence-related advance? So that's like. If you think in the field, things have been done, but they've been done in like samples of 20 undergrads here, 20 undergrads there, 20 undergrads here, and the results don't make sense, and someone says, fine, you know what? I'm going to take people from China, I'm going to take people from the US, I'm going to take people from Germany, I'm going to take people from Chile, I'm going to take all of these different ages, and I'm going to answer this question for once and for all. This is a bit of an exaggeration. But you're not, you're not doing new methods, you're not asking a new question, but it's something of importance that's been unanswered in the field because no one has had adequate evidence to answer the question. That's also something that we think is important because that serves as like a foundation block, a building block for the field to finally grow and stop saying, well, these guys found this, but that might be because they used 22 and we used 30, you know? So that would be an evidence-related event. And then again, the extent of these different advances differs in terms of journals, but these are the type of advances that we look for. And I think a conceptual advance is quite clear. A methodological advance, 
you need to, sh to show that it's an advance. So this means if you have, let's say the field has been using method X and now you're coming up with method Y, you have to compare them. You have to say, look, here was method X, this is method Y, method Y is better because it does this, right? Just showing that it's a new method isn't enough. It has to be showing, you're, think of it this way, you're trying to, pre to convince somebody to use your new method. How, how do you convince somebody to use a method? Think of, well, what do salespeople do? They demonstrate. They're like, this knife is better. See this knife cutting a tomato? And the tomato was splop. Mm -hmm. Look at this knife cut a tomato, and you get a beautiful tomato set. You, you need to do that for the methods of that, right? Um, and then the policy related societal advance. These are ones that maybe are not coming up with a new question or a new, like the, the concept. I'm just thinking we published one recently on uh, the mindset of teachers and how being open-minded is really good for students. Like, this isn't a new idea, but the amount of impact they were able to have with a small scalable intervention was large. So this is really important for society, which is why um, this is something that is a huge advance because it's actually able to change many lives. So those are the, yeah. And the idea of that category is you've already Intervene, you've already gotten the state of whatever, the country, whatever, to change its policy, or you've demonstrated it and now you can't wish to adopt it. Right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, for, sorry, so for a policy by in advance, the idea is you're publishing about you already convinced some local government to do something differently, and now you're showing it off? It doesn't have to okay. be, no. It can be, um, to say policy related, like the, there was a paper in Nature Energy recently which was looking at what just showing your energy consumption while you're taking a shower does to your energy consumption. And so some rooms have it, some rooms don't, a bunch of different hotels and da da da. And then they just look at what happens. So that's policy related because you're now providing evidence in you know, thousands of different hotels, different people, la 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 la, that a really simple intervention, which is just a visible meter, has an impact. So that's a policy. You don't need to right. know. Policy that. adoption is not a prerequisite for it. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. we're still academics. Right. So it's just like this idea that you know you seeing something or being aware of something can change behavior conceptually isn't new. If you tell me like, hey, there's somebody watching you, will that change your behavior? Yes. So like this idea that, that if something visible changes behavior isn't conceptually new, but the way that they were um, implementing it and the strength of the results are very relevant for policy. So that is something that's then considered uh, an advance. Um, and then the last point, well, I, these aren't really in order per se, is um, the evidence, the strength of evidence. So the validity, generalizability, and reliability. You don't need all of the I mean, you can do all of these things, but the question is how much. So the validity is, you know, is, are, are your results actually valid? Um, the generalizability depends on your question, right? If you want, if to make your scope of the research question broad, you want to be talking about, like, people, then you need to test a whole bunch of different kinds of people, right? You can't just test a very narrow sample. Um, if you want to draw more specific conclusions and you want to say like college students in elite colleges, well then you need to have college students in elite colleges. But the point is like, is the evidence there to ensure the conclusions that you are going to draw? So if you want to talk about college students, you can't talk about a single college. You have to talk about different colleges or you have to say, you know, people here at Northeastern, right? So it's just our, right, and that will then, you know, let's say you do something like that, then the scope becomes more narrow. Um, and then the reliability, of course, is are your, are your results reliable? Have you actually looked at them to make sure that it's not just because you used method A and actually if you used method B, it would be very different, you know? Um, is there replication when necessary? Etc. So that's something else that we assess. So then basically, these are the questions. So when I read a paper, 
I write my little summary, and then I have my, my persuasive paragraph, which is basically answers to these questions and saying why or not it will go out to review. And so if I feel that the strength, you know, it's, it's broad scope, um, like let's say it's a conceptual advance, which is a broad one in scope because it's changing the way that we think about information diffusion. And I think that the evidence presented is strong enough to back up that conclusion. Then I would say, you know, these are the reasons, that's why I'm sending it out to a review. Or if it's making broad claims about mental health in adolescents, but it's looking at one specific school, you know, I'll say mental health in adolescents is something of broad relevance, but unfortunately the data here are not sufficient. They also only have um, self-report measures. We have no clinical diagnoses of any mental health issues you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the strength of evidence isn't there, so it's going to be rejected. So just to give you an idea of how we think. Um, it is somehow already three, so um, I'm going to skip all of these things, but basically that's the way we think about things. Um, these other things is I had a bunch of uh, just things that we think about in terms of assessing the validity for scientific claims, so looking at the source of variability, um, confounding variables. Um, these are just basic ideas. I can share my slides if you want to go through this. Um, this is by no means an extensive or exclusive list. It's just sort of things that we think about in when we're, um, again, looking at what's shown, really trying to understand what's shown. Um, yeah, so I think that these I'm just going to skip over at this point because they all go into the strength of evidence. It's just specific points. This last one is just saying um, the he humans are variable and it's very different, difficult to extrapolate. We discussed this before. So, you know, looking at where you're looking at the number of data points um, and where you look on a curve, you could get something very different, right? So it's important to be aware of your own constraints, say them, um, and I think I'm going to skip over all of this and just say, because this we talked about, um, when writing your paper, really do this. The more that you can explain and show as opposed to hype, the more likely you are to convince us. Because we like we like going through all of that, you know, understanding and that critical thinking. Like it's really fun. That's what we like to do. Um, and we do discuss the paper. Um, we don't make our decisions in isolation. So I recognize that my logic can also be flawed, which is why we discuss with the other editors who have the relevant expertise um, to help us and um, but we do make the main decisions. So again, reaching out to the editor, and also you can always ask for an explanation of a decision or appeal. I'm just gonna finish that. Yeah, this is oh yeah, this is the thing that we make uh, decisions based on argument, not vote count. Um, and that post review, we discuss all of the decisions. So we really do try to make sure that we're not being biased, um, and our providing logical arguments. Um, and then I guess this is the other thing. For borderline decisions, we don't want to tire authors or reviewers. We don't want papers that go through five rounds of review to be rejected. So sometimes it is actually, you know, you're on, you're on the cusp and it's a rejection. If you really, like, get in touch if you think that you can make that go forward. It's, for us, part of the decision is saving everybody's time. Um, and if you think that we've made that assumption an error, please let us know. So I guess that's um, the appealing part. So if you are unhappy with our decisions, um, you should let us know. And we do take these seriously. Um, but consider your case realistically. Like the paper, if it's my paper and you appeal, it's coming back to me. So you're not going to get. Like it's discussed with the team, right? It's not just me, but you're still going to be dealing with me. Um, and basically, these are the things, this is the helpful side, this is the non-helpful side. 
um, again, it's the logic of the argument. So if you have data that can address the issue, that's really good. If you can show that the referee has made factual errors, that's also okay. And I mean, you can, you know, how do you do that? Let's say, give me a reference for the paper. Like, let's say you use analysis X and they say that's not suitable, and there's a paper that shows it, you know, and I've missed that in reading the paper, just send that to me and be like, hey, they said this, but this is actually okay. Right, that's convincing. Or um, providing evidence of bias of the reviewer, saying that you don't think, you think that they're biased isn't always the best, um, but if you can show like, look, you know, I mean, I have a specific case in mind, but you can show that these people have publicly spoken on this side very strongly a lot. You know, that's an evidence of bias that I'll take into account. But if you just say, I think that reviewer two is so and so and they don't like me, that's less helpful. So um, the referees are unfair. Again, because we're persuaded by arguments of the referees, when we hear referees are unfair, it's like, no, we took their arguments into account. They make sense. So tell me why they're unfair. Like, is the argument flawed? Are they bringing up things that aren't realistic? The cosmetic rewriting of the paper, I've had this happen, right? People just uh, remove the parts that are problematic. That also doesn't help, right? If you just delete, you're just like, oh, that figure they questioned that showed these effects, it's gone. <laughs> and we reframed our hypotheses to like, take it out. You're like, well, that's horrible science. Don't do that. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna like your paper more, right? Just like shoving it under the rug doesn't work or just cosmetically changing it. Um, yeah, this, this other celebrity endorsement and statements about author's reputation, right? If you tell me like, well, I was, you know, I presented this and these people came by and said this was the most exciting talk of the conference. Again, not helpful. Neither are statements about reputation, like I am so and so, therefore this is the best paper. Um, so, like, these are the ways. So if, you know, because I'm trying to handle papers across a variety of disciplines and I try to approach every paper uh, by understanding the logic, why it could be important, and same with the referees, of course, um, but I can, I can misunderstand things. Um, I can make mistakes, I'm human too, so, you know, if, if you have, if I make a mistake, that's good. I would just encourage you to, you know, consider this top part in terms of how you appeal the decision and also to sleep on it. The data that I do have is like, when you send the reject and you get an appeal five minutes later, those ones are not successful, and the longer the time that goes by between that rejection letter and the appeal coming in, the more successful the appeal is likely to be, because then it's not this emotional knee-jerk response of like, who are you, you person, to reject this work? But it's like, you know, we went through the reviews and actually these points are addressable, there are these errors, and we have these data, we just hadn't included it before, but now, with this, you know, we can actually show stronger support. Those usually go through. So do, you know, appeals aren't an editor's favorite. So do consider your appeals, but do also consider that we're learning as well and that you can always reach out. You can also reach out first by email to say, could you give me more information on the rejection? And then based on that, use it to tailor an appeal, but do consider that to make this fruitful, like we have to learn from each other and sometimes we make mistakes. Um, great, so I'm over, this is just to say that relationship between journals, um, we do talk to our colleagues, so we all sit in an open space and we have communities, so I'm part of the social science community and the complexity community, um, and that goes across journals. And so the point of this is though, while each journal makes its own decisions, we have like, you know, this idea of where I told you where nature is, where nature human behavior is, where nature communications are, is that we know where each person stands and so we make recommendations and sometimes we'll also consult. Um, and so that means that I can talk to my, I can go over and say, hey, I have this paper, I think it's really cool, but it's too specialist, would you take it at nature communications? And if they say yes, I can in my decision letter Right, we can't consider it for nature, but if you send it to nature communications, they will send it out to review. 
That can happen at any point in the process. So it can also happen um, after review, if it's rejected post-review. And let's say it's rejected post-review in nature because you would need a bunch more experiments. But Nature Communications doesn't need those experiments. They can say, actually, we'll accept in principle as is, because we don't need that extra stuff. Um, this is something that editors are very much encouraged to do, and we do do. But we're people too, which means that when loads are really high, we don't do this as much as we should, right? Like ideal, in an ideal world, we would do this for all the papers that we think would be a good fit for the other journal. In a realistic world, we're also trying to get through our, our load and you know, taking the time to go and have a discussion with somebody else and get a decision from them and then go back to us is additional time that like, is good to take, but sometimes doesn't happen. So if you ever want this, you can email the editor and say, I know you rejected it. Could you check whether it would be suitable for a sister journal? And then we'll do it. So keep that in mind as well. Um, and that can be before or after review. You can also opt out of this process, right? It doesn't have to happen. There can be an opt out. You can say, I don't want you to ever do this, but if you want it, it's also there. And then double blind peer review, that I think everybody knows about. Editors are never blind to the process. It's a question I get. Um, this is because of the logistic hurdles. So we need people not to, we need people to review who are unbiased. Um, and so imagine you send me a paper and I don't know who you are, so I think, oh, who's the expert in the field? And I send it to you to review, right? Like, <laughs> that doesn't work very well. Um, so we need to find reviewers and we need to communicate. So just logistically, we always know, but the reviewer, we can do double lines the other way. Um, great. So sorry that went over and there was a lot skipped through, but thank you. And that's how you can reach me. Well, we, um, I'm aware of the time. So why don't we just take one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, you'll share the slides with us? Yeah, of course. That, uh, yeah. Great. So then we'll, we'll uh, yeah. and it's okay if we send it around. To yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just ask, don't um, post like externally. No, no, no. We won't, we won't put it on, post up on the website. But, yeah, but internally for yeah. sure. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. so, so just one or two more questions and then we'll, we'll disperse that. Yeah. So my question is about the cover letters. Yeah. Are you a cover letter reader first and then a paper, or a paper reader first and then a cover letter? And then following up on that, what do you think are like the best things that authors can do in the cover letter to do mm -hmm. of their work? Yeah. So I usually actually do bookends. So what I do is I read the cover letter, which usually when it's a good cover letter will have the highlighted points of like this manuscript has contributed points, you know, ABC. Um, then I read the paper and I usually by that time have like forgotten part of the cover letter. And then I go back to see if my points match the cover letter points. Um, so I read the cover letter first because it gives me a good idea from the get-go of the importance of the problem, often more so than the paper because it's written in a more condensed form to really say like this is the problem we're addressing, these are the points that we've made. Um, but I do then always check to see if my matchup, my own matchup, comes true because there are also times when the cover letter has like really grand statements that don't quite come out in the paper. Um, so just to sort of to see where those two go. So I find the cover letter really important. I think people, my editorial colleagues who have a very narrow discipline, so I'm just going to give an example, like at Nature Neuroscience they have eight editors within the neurosciences and so they have very specific remits. So if you're in a like very specific systems neuroscience, they tend not to read the cover letter because they're dealing with like this very specific field. And it's, like at the beginning, I think they do, but after like 10 years of that, that little loop, they read it less because they feel like they have this broad, this understanding already. Um, I have never felt that because I'm covering like I'm covering a lot, so I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and exactly, if you just can state concisely the problem, why it's important, the things that your manuscript finds, um, that's really helpful because it it gives it gives a nice synthesis and sets up good expectations. 
but they should always match the paper. That unfortunately is, is one of the things that can get a paper killed is the, is the height because when you read a paper that looks like, that is claiming something that it can't show, it makes you fundamentally distrust what's being shown because you, you know, and I try not to get, have that get to me, but it's there, right? If, if a, yeah. That may be a good note. Uh, don't hype. So. Yeah, don't hype. <laughs> so I yeah. think that there's a good lesson you know, for life there. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> show, show. The data is really cool. It speaks for itself. It doesn't need to be striking and novel and cool. I mean, if you present the data and the effect sizes and, and all of the statistical details, like that, that's all you need <laughs> to an informed reader. <laughs> Well, uh, I think that's that's great, and uh, thank you, uh, Mary Elizabeth. This was just uh, terrifically helpful. So. Great, thank you.